Welcome to Rooted Intentionally. I'm Susan Carson, and it's my passion to create safe space for transformational encounters through listening prayer and spiritual practices. And in these podcasts, we're bringing you conversations and spiritual practices, all designed to help us live more deeply rooted in the love of God. And today I have the honor and joy of bringing you Rich Viotas. Rich, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Susan. Uh, such a, a gracious invitation that you've offered to me. So I uh, look forward to a good conversation with you. Thank you. Me too. I'm super excited. So for folks who don't yet know you, you are a Brooklyn born pastor and a uh, pastor of New Life Fellowship, which is a large, multi-ethnic, super diverse church um, in Queens. Am I right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So New York beginning to end to through and through. You're a prolific uh, writer, speaker, and your first book, The Deeply Formed Life, came to us a couple of years ago. What, two, two years ago now? Yeah, September of 2020. Yeah, and your brand new baby book, <laughs> Good and Beautiful and Kind, uh, is out now, and um, just such powerful, powerful, powerful books. So we're going to talk a lot about the new book, um, but is there anything else before we start, anything else you want people to know about you? Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I've been at New Life for 14 years, uh, and mm -hmm. as the lead pastor for uh, nine years, so I'll, I'll make my 10 year anniversary next year. Wow. Uh, and yeah, uh, quite a remarkable community. But see, hearing that like 15 years next year sounds, yeah, that's that's a long time in a community. So um, that's probably the only thing I'll add. And you know, and husband to Rosie of 16 years, and uh, father to Karis, who's 13, and uh, Nathan, who just turned eight. So uh, wow. lots of fullness in our in our home. That's for sure. Lovely. And I will add with that that I love following you on social media and seeing not just your your amazing quotes that you offer us, but your family life and the beauty of what's going on at your church there. Mm. So thanks for sharing that all with us. Um, well, let's, let's jump in. Uh, a question I often begin with, with our guests, we talk a lot in our community about living more deeply rooted in the love of God. And I know that's language that you use as well. So I'm wondering in your life right now, um, in the busyness of releasing a new book and family life and church life, what's helping you live more deeply rooted in God's love in your life right now? Yeah, you know, it's it's ironic that um, I, I just wrote a book and it for me, it's often books that help me stay rooted. And uh, I, I'd like to, on a regular basis, be reading something along the lines of prayer something along the lines of contemplative life, because I just need other voices that are mentoring me and coaching me and encouraging me. And so uh, I have this right on my desk here, just I'm reading this uh, John Cassian, who's um, mm. kind of one of the theological forerunners of monasticism, uh, contemporary of St. Augustine, and just reading about his his words as it relates to prayer and scripture. Uh, and so I just got through the introduction last night of just his life and uh, mm. finding my, I regularly need a book on prayer to help me to pray uh, because I, my soul very easily wanders from God. Uh, and I just need something to help keep me tethered to prayer. And, um, and so I, I, people say, well, you read so much, Rich. I'm thinking the reason I read so much is because my soul wanders very quickly. And uh, I just need something to keep me uh, anchored to God. So that's, uh, I think, something right now that's really helping me to stay connected in prayer to God. Mm, I love that. I'm so curious because I noticed in your writing this contemplative thread, this prayerful thread through everything, it seems, that you write. Um, and so I wonder how that came to you in your life. You know, part of it came through... Um, 
I think modeling from my grandfather initially, you know, I became a Christian mm. at 19 and for, uh, I tell the story at different places, uh, for eight months after becoming a Christian, my grandfather mentored me at the edge of his bed for uh, eight months, two to three hours each time, four to five days a week. Wow. And I sat with him, watching him, uh, watching him pray, watching him read scripture, having conversations on scripture. And so my introduction to Christianity and Christian faith within the first eight months was being discipled by my grandfather and his love for books, his love for understanding scripture set me on a particular trajectory. And then after that, I, I, I just really feel blessed to have had a number of different mentors, beginning with my grandfather, who have helped me to love God with my mind, uh, to love God through reflection, uh, and uh, and so, which was surprise. I don't know how I graduated high school because I don't think I read a book in high school. I was <laughs> I was not a good student in high school. I I, I knew I had some smarts. Uh, and so I was able to skim by, but I never applied myself mm -hmm. until probably my third year in college. Uh, and wow. so, <laughs> and so, uh, so I'm a late bloomer in that kind of a way. But, but I think it began with my grandfather who modeled it for me. Mm, that's beautiful. And I will just say you're a wonderful writer. So that surprises me that that wasn't translating academically, but there are probably lots of reasons for that. So. Only, and, and you know what I've discovered? Someone asked me a question recently because they said, how long have you been writing? And I said, well, I really started writing in 2014, 20, but then I look back, I had been blogging since maybe 2007, uh -huh. but even before that, um, I, it's, I used to be a rapper. My father was a DJ. My father still is a DJ, actually, on the, on the, on the side. And so I have been writing poetry uh, in the form of rap songs since second grade. Uh, and so I have had a thing for, um, uh, for poetry, for rhythm, for cadence, for word plays. Uh, and it's been something I've done since, since I was seven, eight years old. Wow. Uh, and so I've been writing for in that way for decades, as I, if I look at it from that perspective. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's fun. What a fun way to enter <laughs> that whole world of writing. Well, it sounds like you have a really rich spiritual heritage, even within your family. Um, and so as we sort of move towards talking about your book, we've been in a series called healing our image of God. And so I'm curious about how your image of God was formed and maybe how that's um, evolved or changed over time. How did you come to this good and beautiful and kind God? You know, early on, I, I, I did have early conceptions of God because uh, my parents used to send me to church with my with my grandparents when I was six, seven, eight years old, so maybe six to 12 years old, I would go um, sometimes some years frequently, sometimes here and there, but, uh, my early conceptions of God was that God was holy, was a Latino Pentecostal mm -hmm. church, small church, some 20 to 40 people, but I saw plenty of kind of Pentecostal manifestations of God or healings, uh, people, uh, falling on the floor. So my first conception of God was God is holy. Do not get on God's bad side. That was number <laughs> one, you know? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and that the sanctuary is a holy place. So I remember in one church, in order to go to the bathroom, I had to move towards the preacher because it was a narrow church. I had to run, move towards where the pulpit was and then three rows in, then I make a sharp left and then the bathroom is there. I can't tell you how many times I had to go to the bathroom during a sermon, but I was afraid to get up because mm -hmm. if I got up during, especially during the sermon, like I would, something bad was going to happen if I got up. You know, this is too holy. <laughs> and so in, in one way, there was God is holy, sacred. The bad part was, which is true. There is a sacredness, holiness to God. But I, the way I saw holiness was pretty negative. It wasn't that God's mm. purity, God's otherness. God cannot be captured with our, God needs to be revealed to us. Any kind of 
projections that we have on God will always fall short. Uh, and so that was my early conceptions of God. Uh, by the time I became a teenager, I was not going to church, but I had some Christian friends. And again, it was very, God was, it was punitive. It was mm. retribution. If you do something bad, God, watch out, God's going to get you. So it was that, you know, God is watching was always <laughs> a phrase that showed up in, in my family. God is watching. And it was always <laughs> never like God is watching because God loves you and God knows where you're at is God is watching and you better watch your back because mm. you can be taken out in this moment. And mm. I think my image of God began to get healed um, uh, partly when I became a Christian at 19. But I think something happened after reading a book from Henry Nouwen on oh. the return of the prodigal son. And I read it in college. Uh, I was maybe 21 years old. And a, uh, one of my professors assigned me, assigned me that, uh, that book to read for a spiritual mm -hmm. formation class that was part of a part of and, and allowing Nouwen's words to, um, to reframe how I see God. That was, that was huge. Uh, another book that I know helped me significantly was Brennan Manning's book, uh, <laughs> The Ragamuffin Gospel. Yeah. And so by the time I was 21, 22 years old, I had, which is why, a testament to why we need good books. I was introduced to um, a vision of God that was informed by the person of Jesus that really healed those previous images where I saw holiness simply as uh, a threat. And I saw God as watching, but in a punitive, uh, uh, you know, way that was going to lead to, you know, my retribution. So I think from that point on, something happened to me where my image of God was healed in that way. And I think I, but this is what I know about myself. The residue of those earlier years still remain in me. And I must consistently turn back to Jesus in the scriptures and to books that I think have uh, encountered these authors that have encountered something of God's goodness and God's mm -hmm. character. So that residue is deep in me and I need lots of reminders of who God is in Christ to have my image of God healed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I can, uh, those writers you mentioned now and then Manning are very dear to me. The, uh, now in's life of the beloved was a big yeah. turning point book for me. So um, I can definitely relate to that. Um, so as you bring us to this good and beautiful and kind God, it, it was surprising to me as you look at uh, what, what is fragmenting us, right? As individuals in a, and as a community, you very boldly start with a chapter on sin right out of the gate. <laughs> I was like, oh, we're going to go there. <laughs> so your first three chapters are, I think, powerful, um, just powerful perspectives on what mm -hmm. is fragmenting us, yeah. especially the chapter on trauma. But I'd just love to hear you talk a little bit on how you sort of came to that and yeah, yeah you, you know, sort of baptize us right into it. <laughs> you know, it really, it, it comes out a, a couple of ways. I think it does flow out of um, the imagery of Langston Hughes. And Langston Hughes is where, I, you know, his poem is where I got the title from my book. He wrote a poem called Tired. And Hughes said, you know, the poem goes, I'm so tired of waiting, aren't you, for the world to become good and beautiful and kind. Mm -hmm. Let us take a knife and cut the world in two and see what worms are eating at the rind. Mm -hmm. And when Hughes uh, writes that poem, he, he names the aches of our soul, the longings of our soul for goodness, beauty, and, and kindness. Uh, but then he mentions the worms. And I just thought, I, I think I need to situate our fractured, fragmented lives uh, using kind of ancient theological language but coming at it in a fresh way mm -hmm. uh and beginning with sin uh i'm not, yeah I, I think to myself like why, why did i do that uh and, <laughs> and i think part of it is because it's a word that's used so often but uh in very myopic ways uh uh so that's number one two um 
I'm, I'm trying to name the nature of our fractures from a theological place, not just a psychological or sociological starting point. And so there are lots of wonderful books that talk about the sociological and psychological um, uh, fractures of our world. And I think we need all of those books to help us better understand why our world is so um, you know, tearing itself apart. But as a Christian, as a pastor, as someone who loves theology, I think theology has a very important place to give us the fuller picture of it. And so to see the way I try to think about sin is sin is not just simply uh, failure to live up to a standard, failure to um, uh, uh, fulfill a law, failure to um, live according to a set of rules. Uh, for me, sin at its core is failure to love, mm -hmm. failure to love God failure to love our neighbor as ourself. And so if I could reframe sin to say the problem that we're getting at because it's so deep requires a source outside of us, which is why, you know, Barbara Brown Taylor, who I quote in the, in that opening chapter, she says something really scandalous. She says that sin is our only hope. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, no, I thought Jesus was our only hope. And her, her <laughs> thought is until we understand the pernicious and pervasive nature of sin, we won't really get the fuller picture of our the level of our captivity, the level our, of our estrangement, the, layer, the level of our bondage, which hopefully will allow us to call out to a good and beautiful and kind God who wants to liberate us from these things. So, uh, but I begin there really to locate us uh, in terms of um, what eats away at goodness, beauty, and kindness is not simply we have, we need to learn a couple of emotional health skills here or there. Mm -hmm. uh, what's really at the core of it is a principle that's orienting the world inward, which is sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so helpful that sin is the failure to love, mm -hmm. um, to love God, to love others, to love ourselves. <laughs> um, and then you move into another topic that maybe isn't always <laughs> these days <laughs> addressed as much, right? As powers and principalities. <laughs> I was like, wow, Rich is really <laughs> stirring the waters in the best way. Yes, yes. You know, you know, with that, I was trying to, again, the last couple of years we have mm -hmm. seen what I have called the convergence of three different forces. I've called it the CPR world, the world in which our hearts are ailing, a world in which it's hard to breathe. And it's this convergence of COVID, political idolatry, racial injustice, racial hostility. And those three forces have brought on so much havoc in our world. And I think sometimes when we look at what's going on in our world, um, the, the everyday language that we use to describe the problems sometimes just don't suffice. And so much like sin, there's something beyond us, another pernicious power that's at work in the world. And the Bible actually gives language for this. Uh, you know, this is Ephesians 6, where Paul says, you know, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against these powers. And so for me, it's these powers are, these principalities are these, uh, these, uh, these forces that are at work in the world that get attached to individuals, ideologies, and institutions mm -hmm. whose primary task is deception, depersonalization, and division. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to get at is we must pay attention to the inner workings of our institutions and the inner workings of that there's something that we cannot see with our eyes that find root in our world that's doing significant damage in us to us through us which is why on my i often have in my i'm in my office right now a church and i often have on the whiteboard it's filled with some other stuff but i often put from time to time a question am i being used by the powers Am I being complicit in depersonalization, in deception, in division? Because there's something outside of me that's at work that's trying to seduce me uh, into a different kind of kingdom. 
And so having that language, I think, is really important because, again, we can't understand the level of our estrangement without these theological categories that scripture gives us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so helpful. It's so helpful. And I hear uh, what sounds like a practice of really self-examination in that Mm -hmm. that's quite intentional. Yeah, I'm aware of, and part of this is is good mentors who have said hard things to me, uh, uh, people in my life that have helped me to see even something like um, you know, to grow in uh, influence in the world uh, brings with it lots of danger to my soul. Uh, things that I was not wrestling with uh, a few years ago. Powers, uh, when you start talking about uh, influence, authority, power, money across the board, like if I'm not careful, my soul is in great danger. So I think I, I need to practice ongoingly just self-examination to at least hopefully live in reality uh, of all the ways, you know, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it prone to the God I love. I mean, I, every time we sing that song in our church and I get to that song, I'm just like, yeah, that's my life story. Uh, and so whether it's sin or whether it's powers or principalities, um, there's something at work in the world that we must be mindful of. Yeah. Yes. And that, that level of sort of waking up and being mindful, I feel is what I'm called to as I read these chapters. Um, and then you, you bring us to trauma, right? Our wounding that we're often also not aware of. And I was, as someone who works a lot in inner healing, listening and healing prayer and sits and, and prays with people through trauma, um, I was like, yes, thank you. Thank you, because it feels like, especially now post COVID, we're all sort of with everything politically, everything going on in the world, we're we're all a bit like burn victims, I think. We're we're all traumatized. And so to name that and lift that up, I think is so helpful for people. Yeah. And you know, part of the, the in terms of the progression of writing the book, if if we do live in a world that's marked by sin. Uh, and we have these powers and principalities, really the combination of those two things is going to lead to a traumatized world. And so trauma, I think, is a Christian category uh, in, in so far that trauma means to wound. And at the very center of our faith is a wounded Messiah. Mm someone who understands what it means to be traumatized, someone who understands what it means to be wounded. And so uh, I, I, hear, I hear a lot of resistance from a number of people in the church, especially that uh, we are exaggerating our traumas, that everything is traumatic. Now. And I think I, I can't speak for how people are expressing their traumas or if they're using it as a catch-all phrase for anything that's remotely challenging to their lives. I can't speak for everyone because I'm not in everyone's head. Uh, However, I do see the importance of recognizing we live in a wounded and wounding world, Uh, a world in which things happen that should not have happened or things did not happen that should have happened. And uh, no matter where we are on the spectrum, Christianity offers us language, uh, theology, as well as ways forward to live beyond our woundedness so that we are not perpetuating it, uh, you know, one generation to the next or one relationship to the next. Uh, And so I I do think there's much revelation to be found in our wounds uh, and the degree to which we can face those wounds in the presence of God and community with others is the degree to which we can find freedom from them so that we can love well. And that's the, that's the, that's what I'm trying to get at our traumatized lives, the reason why I want to pay attention to it is not simply because I want to grow in more self-awareness or self-actualization. I want this chapter and my focus on it to help us move towards love. The reason why people don't love well is because they've been so wounded. Uh, And wounded people who are not facing their wounds in the presence of God in the community of others are simply going to be wounded wounders. 
Yeah. And uh, the hope is how do we move towards wholeness and which a quick word on wholeness, that's not simply that there's nothing broken in me. Wholeness for me is that we're living lives of integration, of integrity and intimacy, loving well. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we need the language of trauma to help us understand the human condition as well as what it means to live in wholeness and in freedom from it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so helpful, I think. And then you do, you lead us the whole rest of the book. Here's the good news. The whole rest of the book <laughs> leads us right into that love. How do we, how do we live in that love in our, within ourselves and with each other? Yeah. Um, and I wanted to sort of pull on that prayer thread a little bit as part of that. Um, this is a quote from the book, many followers of Christ have not learned to pray in a way that opens us up to God's healing. Prayer is meant to be where love is nurtured. It's in the true praying moment that God heightens our awareness that we are already enveloped in his loving union, which enables us to extend that love to others. Um, it's so powerful. I think it's so true and we've touched on this a little bit but i'd love to hear more about what that kind of prayer looks like for you and how you help others sort of engage in that kind of prayer yeah you know i, I what i've tried to do as a pastor is swing the pendulum uh from seeing prayer as um transactionalism to communion mm -hmm. and uh, prayer, I think the way that we are classically taught to pray, culturally taught to pray, is our task is to lift our requests, uh, share what we need to God uh, using particular spiritual language with a particular kind of emotional intensity. And that's kind of the recipe to get God to do things that we want. And, uh, and I'm totally fine with petitionary prayer. I mean, I lift plenty of petitions before God and, I'm, and I love intercession. I think intercession helps me not to center myself in the prayer moment, mm -hmm. but to be aware of the pain of the world around me. And so I do those things, but I think I try to do those things out of a place of communion, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to God, I need you to do certain things for me or uh, for others. Uh, and I think God then becomes just a means to an end. Uh, mm -hmm. I go to God to get something done, as opposed to I go to God to experience communion. I go to God to, to live in love. I, I go to God to practice presence, to be with being, uh, mm -hmm. to be uh, embraced by the Father, to be a friend of Jesus, to have communion with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I, that's why I come to prayer. And what I, what I'm trying to get at is one of the fruits of prayer, uh, is the practice of presence. Uh, mm -hmm. I am not just me being present to God, but training my soul to be present to others, uh, to see within them the, 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 the divine stamp, the image bearing stamp on their lives, mm -hmm. to see the, the pains and the hurts and the trauma beneath the surface, to see the ways that sin has ravaged their lives and to be present as a gift to them. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the challenging thing about contemplative prayer in this way is you only understand it when you get in it. If there's certain things that I could go on a whiteboard and explain it to someone and say, do you understand? They go, yeah, I understand totally. Uh, but there's certain things that can only be understood uh, as you're in it. Uh, it, it, you, it, I can't understand it intellectually, conceptually. I can give some 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 guide rails and some some handles here, but I can't really understand it until I immerse myself in it. And I think that's the gift of contemplative prayer because um, what it is is I'm walking by faith and not by sight here. Mm -hmm. uh, I am allowing myself to enter into mystery. I am allowing myself to enter into a here and trusting that God is going to meet me in love. Uh, and I think that is really the pendulum needs to be swung because prayer, I believe, you know, 
I, I like to say that the fruit of the, the spirit grows in the soil of abiding prayer. And uh, God does something in us. What science is discovering through, uh, through research on things like mindfulness and such is that there are uh, neurological changes that happen when we give ourselves to meditation and give ourselves to prayer. Uh, and so I welcome the scientific discoveries, mm -hmm. uh, the discoveries that theology has known all along, uh, that if we give ourselves to God in this kind of way, that our very being will be changed and um, so that we can be with others, which is mm -hmm. what I really believe is the goal and the fruit of prayer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah, you're right. Uh, for me, this is just for me, <laughs> your book is full of gold. And I don't say that lightly. Mm -hmm. But for me, one of the biggest nuggets was at toward the very end of the book when you talk about abiding. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you to you again. <laughs> um, to abide in God's love can sound ethereal and abstract, like something restricted for the spiritual elite, but it's not, not at all. Abiding in love is for anyone who wants to do it, but it requires something of most of us, a fundamental shift in our perspective. Many people find it difficult to open themselves to God's love because the image they have of him is not compatible with such love. He is often perceived as the disappointed one, the angry one, or the indifferent one. When one of these false images is in our mind, it makes little sense to open ourselves up to this God. This is why the fundamental task of living in love and pouring it out on others is found in the healing of our image of God, something Jesus came to do. And then you invite us to two simple practices or choices, two parts. And I, mm. I would love for you to speak to this because this is right at the heart of where my journey is and where this community is. So, yeah, you know, I, I Usually when people talk about prayer or abiding in God, uh, it tends to be begin with practices and um, which I think um, I don't think that's the right place to begin uh, mm -hmm. because we can have new practices, but still have the old operating system. Uh, and and so at the, we have not been changed at the core or we have not allowed our our perception of who God is to be changed. It's almost like it's putting new wine into old wine skins. Uh, at, it's going to tear. It doesn't have the capacity to absorb it. Uh, and so the healing, you know, to practice something like contemplative prayer, we go into it with a number of things. We go into it with our own histories, our own traumas, our own projections, our own uh, unresolved uh, emotional uh, issues, and we have a way of projecting that out to God. Uh, and so the God that we're in relationship with in prayer often does not reflect the God who Jesus Christ comes to reveal, mm -hmm. which I think that's the first work we have to do. The first work we have to do is understand to whom are we praying? To whom are we with? Who are, who are we orienting our words to? Who are we sharing presence with? Mm -hmm. And I think when we can start off there, this is who we are in relationship with. We are in relationship with uh, the, the tender one. We are in a relationship with the holy one. We are in, in relationship with, with the forgiving, merciful one. Uh, when we begin there, I think we're able to, to relax. And I think that's, you know, it was a theologian named Dale Bruner, reformed theologian, who he wrote, a, he wrote my two favorite commentaries on the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of John. And he writes um, with such depth and, contem you know, contemplative um, awareness. And he says, he, he gives that language of the, what does it mean to rest in God? To rest in God is to relax in God and just gives that image of relaxing. Mm -hmm. But how can I relax if I believe that the God to whom I'm in conversation with is ready to zap me at any given moment, uh, is ready to bring on some calamity on my life because I have not been consistent in my life with prayer. Uh, I mean, I'm always on my toes. I'm always walking on eggshells with this God. So I think before we can talk about practice, we have to talk about perception. We have to talk about who, who, who we are in relationship with. So, and Jesus 
which is why one of the best things we can do to enrich our prayer life is to spend time watching Jesus work, uh, looking at Jesus in the scriptures, uh, looking at who he heals, who is he tender to, uh, how does he uh, walk through the villages. And as we allow Jesus to give us really uh, the image of who God is, I think at that point, prayer can go to the next level because now it's done from a place of deep relaxation and rest, as opposed to, is this God going to zap me at any given moment? And there's no relaxing anymore. Uh, so I think that last part of the book is really trying to, and, and in line with what you're trying to do here, Susan, as well, heal the image of the very various images that we have of God. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So good. I have, I have so many more questions for you, but you're going to lead us in a practice and we only have so much time. And, um, so I'd love for you to, to open this space for us, right. To experience. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the things that I teach at, in our congregation and whenever I travel flows out of, uh, what we've done through emotionally healthy, uh, discipleship. Uh, and my, my predecessor, Pete Scazzaro, um, was, you know, the pioneer of this year. And this, what I'm, what I try to help people to do is, uh, face themselves in the presence of God, uh, mm -hmm. recognizing that God is with us. And there's a, a, a very simple practice we teach called exploring the iceberg, which is what does it mean to look within, to be present to God and to be present to ourselves, the particular challenging areas of our lives that we tend to avoid. And so um, for those listening, for those watching, uh, maybe they want to get a journal, get a, something to write with. Um, and I'll invite you just to, to take a deep breath in wherever you're at. And there are four very simple questions that I want you to think about. And as it comes to you, I want you to lift mind and heart to God, which is a good definition of prayer, lifting mind and heart to God. God knows everything about you already. And God invites you to pour out your heart before God. And so four very simple questions and as I lead it, I'm going to give maybe 30, 40 seconds in between. And for any work that uh, you don't get to, or if you feel cut off by this, uh, feel free at the end of this podcast to return to uh, this work here. But here's a very simple question, first of all, that I want you to consider and lift before God. First question is, what are you mad about? What are you mad about? And so just take a moment, wherever you're listening to this from, and offer before God your anger. What are you mad about? Take another 20 seconds. What are you mad about? Moving on to the second question, which is often related to the first. What are you sad about? What are you grieving? What do you need to lift before the Lord that's causing a sense of sadness and grief in your soul? Let's take a moment to lift that up before God.
and take another 20 seconds. What are you sad about? Moving on to the third question, what are you anxious about? What's bringing up anxiety, fear? Is it related to a relationship, your health, your finances, your career? What are you anxious about? What anxiety are you holding? Can you lift that up to God? Take another 30 seconds. And as you do so, maybe ask yourself the question, why am I anxious about this? Why am I anxious? And finally, what are you glad about these days? What is producing joy, life, levity? What are the things that's happened that you just want to pause and thank God for? Uh, maybe it is a new relationship. Maybe it is a surprising sense of peace. Maybe it is a, a new career direction. What, do you, what are you glad about? Take another 20 seconds. What's bringing joy in your life? What are you glad about? And let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for the gifts the gift of prayer, the gift of lifting up mind and heart to you. Thank you that you are God who is safe enough to hold our anger, to hold our sadness, to hold our anxiety and our joy. A God who's with us, a God who knows everything about us, a God who is attuned to our presence. As we lift up all these things to you, may we encounter your love, your grace, and your presence in a new way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So I just want to encourage people as we move towards the end of our time here, uh, we have just touched uh, even as we just did an iceberg practice, we've just touched the tip of the iceberg of all the goodness in this book. So I want to encourage people. I don't 
I don't always say it this strongly, Rich, just so you know, but <laughs> you really do want to read this book. <laughs> and if you want to connect and follow you and be more part of what you're doing, what are the best ways for them to do that? Yeah, it is. A, if folks want to learn more about the book and uh, other things that it's coming up, if they went to just uh, richvalotas.com, that's totally fine. Uh, also on social media, specifically on like Instagram or Twitter, that's often where I'm uh, practicing uh, what I'm thinking about writing on. Uh, and so uh -huh. uh, it's a space where I'm thinking about articles, future books, and I'm just teasing out ideas that I think in seed form, uh, you know, how it might connect with people there. So uh, if they went to, you know, Rich Velotis on Twitter, on Instagram, you'll see some of the stuff that I'm up to. Most of it is reflections and some of it, you'll get some of my sports commentary uh, or just stuff that I'm doing with my family. So, uh, but those two places are probably the best places to check me out. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. You really are very retweetable, I will say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, except when I'm talking about my terrible sports teams. Uh, that's oh, no. Other than that, uh, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> oh, Rich, thanks so much for this time today. Thank you, and Susan. thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, if you'd like to connect with me, find my book, more podcast, YouTube stuff, you can do that at susancarson.net. It's a joy to journey with you. Thanks all for joining us.